Hi. During our last episode, we explored the subject of chemical change. To understand these chemical changes, we have to go deep into the world of atoms and molecules. And as we do so, we must study them with the exactness of science, that is chemistry. Today, we will be discussing how we determine the number of relationships between particles of reacting substances in terms of a quantity called the mole. We'll also look at chemical formulas, chemical equations, and atomic masses. But before we proceed, let's have a short break. changes occur naturally or artificially. A chemical change is natural if it is not influenced by man. Take this green leaf, for instance. It is slowly turning brown. The leaves that fall will soon decay and turn into soil. The larva in this cocoon will change into a butterfly. Those roofs are rusting. But a chemical process may also be one that is planned or carried out deliberately. For some of the natural processes, like those you've just seen, chemists can duplicate in the laboratory. How do they do this? First, they must thoroughly understand the principles that govern chemical changes that occur naturally. Sometimes, a chemical change that seems so simple is really complex. It may involve a series of steps. Chemists studying a process strive to determine all possible steps in a chemical change and the order in which they occur from beginning to end. In other words, they first undertake a qualitative study, seeking to answer the question, what chemicals or reactants combine to produce certain products like this? Then comes the quantitative aspects of a chemist's work. They try to answer the question, what are the proper amounts of reactants that must be combined to come up with a desired product? How do chemists determine these quantities? This is a question we will answer today. Meanwhile, let us revisit some basic concepts we have learned. By the 19th century, scientists agreed that all compounds have definite composition. Their constituent elements, or the elements that make them up, are present in a definite mass ratio. Take the compound water. In water, hydrogen and oxygen are present in a 1 to 8 mass ratio. For every gram of hydrogen, there are 8 grams of oxygen. Are the compounds sodium chloride? In sodium chloride, sodium and chlorine are combined in a 1 to 1.54 mass ratio. What about the compound glucose, the fuel of our body, also known as dextrose? Glucose contains hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen in a 1 to 6 to 8 mass ratio. The composition of each compound is fixed, no matter what the source of the compound is. This rule is true for every compound, whether it be benzene, ethanol, or boric acid. These observations are summarized into the law of definite composition. Why does matter behave according to this law? It was an English school teacher, John Dalton, who explained this law with his atomic theory in 1803. He said that atoms are participants in a chemical change. He defined atoms small, indivisible particles with mass. According to Dalton's theory, all atoms of the same element have the same mass, size, and shape. During chemical reactions, atoms do not change. They are merely rearranged. Dalton also assumed that atoms combine in small whole number ratios when they form compounds. 
Dalton's atomic theory guided scientists in their studies for more than a century. Since then, some of his assumptions have been modified in the light of new scientific data gathered with the use of more sensitive equipment. Since compounds have definite compositions, they can be represented by chemical formulas such as these. These chemical formulas tell us the kind of element present and the atomic ratio, the ratio of the number of atoms by which the reacting elements combine. Take water. Its chemical formula is H2O. What does this tell us? There are two atoms of hydrogen for every atom of oxygen in water. The chemical formula of sodium chloride is NaCl. This means that for sodium chloride, there's one atom of sodium for every atom of chlorine. What about glucose? Its formula is C6H12O6. This means that there are six atoms of carbon, 12 atoms of hydrogen, and six atoms of oxygen in every molecule of glucose. Do you recall what a molecule is? A molecule is the smallest particle of a substance that can exist freely and has all the properties characteristic of that substance. However, this definition is inadequate. The properties of a substance are usually bulk properties. They are so due to collective behavior of an assemblage or big group of particles. Nevertheless, Molecules are thought to act as independent units. The chemical formula H2O represents a molecule of water. But for sodium chloride, NaCl represents not a molecule, but a formula unit of the compound. Unlike water molecules, a pair of sodium and chloride ions cannot exist freely in any of its three phases. In its solid phase, sodium and chloride ions exist in a crystal structure. In its liquid phase, the sodium ion is separated from the chloride ion. The pair of ions cannot be isolated as an independent unit. In its gas phase, the sodium and chloride ions are even more independent and widely separated from each other. In planning a chemical reaction, it is easier to measure the mass of a group of atoms than to count each atom individually. In the case of marbles, we can see and count them easily. In the case of atoms and molecules, it would be impossible to count them even for a very small sample. Just to give you an idea of how small and numerous atoms are, take this 5 milligram speck of copper. It is made of trillions and trillions of atoms. For this reason, it is important in chemistry to translate the atomic ratio by which elements combine into a mass ratio. Instead of counting atoms and molecules, which would be impossible to do, we compare the relative masses of different elements in a compound. Here's a demonstration to help us understand how this works. Consider three identical matchboxes, each containing an equal number of screws. The screws, however, are of different sizes. To compare the mass of each kind of screw with that of the others, it is enough to know that there are equal number of screws in the three boxes. We will determine the mass of the screws in each box using a balance. We adjust the tear to zero out the mass of the matchbox. Therefore, when we weigh the matchbox with the screws inside, the value we obtain is the mass of the screws.
Let us refer to the experimental data in this table. For the same type of screws, the following relationship holds. To compare two kinds of screws, we can use another relationship. Note that the ratio of the total masses of two different boxes of screws is the same as the ratio of the masses of single screws from two different boxes. We can then determine the relative masses of the three screws by dividing each mass by the mass of the lightest screw. Therefore, the screws have relative masses of 1, 1.8, and 3.07. These are unitless quantities expressing the mass ratio. The screw in this example can represent a single molecule or atom. Chemists compute the relative masses of atoms of different elements in the same way. They compare the masses of equal numbers of atoms of different elements. Since 1961, they have used the mass of an atom of carbon as a standard. With this standard, hydrogen, the lightest element, has an atomic mass of 1. The relative atomic mass of each element can be found in the periodic table. An oxygen atom with an atomic mass of 16 has about 16 times more mass than a hydrogen atom. Note that there are very heavy atoms like those of the element Laurentium. The Laurentium atom has a mass 260 times that of the mass of a hydrogen atom. We have now established a link between atomic ratio and mass ratio. More on this after a short break. How do we establish a link between the number of particles and the mass of a given amount of substance? This flask contains exactly 12 grams of the element carbon. This mass of carbon contains a huge number of particles. To be exact, 6.02 times 10 to the 23 atoms. Chemists call this quantity the mole. A mole of any other substance has exactly the same number of particles as is 12 grams of carbon. A mole of water, a mole of ethanol, a mole of sulfur, or a mole of copper. All these have the same number of particles. Now think about this. When we buy eggs in a grocery store, sometimes we can get them in boxes containing a dozen eggs each. It is not important to count the eggs one by one. As long as each box is full, you know that it contains a dozen eggs. We just count the number of boxes. Similarly, substances can be counted in moles. In each mole, there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23 particles. This number is called Avogadro's number, in honor of the Italian scientist Amadeo Avogadro. Try to imagine how big this number is. If we lay one mole of carbon atoms side by side to form a single layer, it will cover more than six times the area of the whole Philippines. And to think that these atoms are microscopic. To give you another idea of how big a number the mole is, take this milliliter of water. The volume of water in the Pacific Ocean is about the same magnitude as the Avogadro's number, that is, the volume of water in the Pacific Ocean will be 6 times 10 to the 23 milliliters. Now we can count particles in mole units. Two moles would have twice the number of particles. In three moles, there are three times as much. What is important is to be consistent. Count either in atoms or in molecules. Just like the screws in the example we used, atoms of different elements have different masses. 
A magnesium atom has twice as much mass as a carbon atom. The mass ratio of one mole each of magnesium and carbon will thus be two to one. Since the mass of a mole or molar mass of carbon is exactly 12 grams, we expect the molar mass of magnesium to be twice its value or exactly 24 grams. The periodic table can help us determine the molar mass of a substance. If the particles of an element are single atoms like carbon, magnesium, helium, and copper, its molar mass is its atomic mass in grams. Some elements exist as diatomic molecules or a pair of atoms, such as hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and chlorine. What are their masses? To get molar mass, we multiply the number of atoms in a molecule by the atomic mass of an element and express it in grams. Look at these examples. For compounds, we obtain molar mass by adding the masses of their constituent atoms. Let us illustrate this with some examples. The molar mass of carbon dioxide is 44.0 grams. The mass of sodium chloride is 58.5 grams. Glucose, 180 grams. The amount of a substance can be expressed as grams or moles. Let us return to our samples of moles of substances. They all have the same number of particles, but do they have the same molar mass? No. The particles in each substance have atomic masses different from those of the particles in other substances. For ionic compounds or compounds that are electrically charged, such as sodium chloride, a formal unit is considered an independent particle. But it is only valid when calculating molar mass. At this point, we must stress that the mole can only be used for measuring quantities of pure substances and not mixtures. Mixtures, remember, are combinations of several substances. Their composition thus varies. That is why we cannot count the amount of gasoline cooking oil, rubber latex, and other mixtures in molds. We will summarize our discussion after a brief pause. definite composition was explained by Dalton's atomic theory. Through an analogy, we also saw how chemists arrive at the concept of relative masses. Finally, we introduced the concept of mole to establish a link between the number of particles and the mass of a substance. In our next episode, we will look for more patterns of chemical changes. This will make our study of chemistry more systematic or scientific. Until then, this is your host Ramon Miranda saying good day. <laughs>